Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Selling Greenville, your favorite real estate podcast here in the greater Greenville area of South Carolina. I'm your host, as always, Stan McCune. I'm a realtor here in the great upstate of South Carolina, and you can catch all of my contact information in the show notes if you need to reach out to me for any reason. And I'd appreciate if you enjoy the show that you hit that subscribe button on whatever app you're using. I'm on a lot of different apps out there, um, including Spotify, despite uh, the whole Joe Rogan fiasco. Um, I am out there on Apple, Google Play, Spotify, Audio Boom, uh, a handful of others. If I'm not on the platform that you want to use, please let me know and I'll try to get out on there. Uh, but hit the subscribe button. And I'd appreciate as well if you could hit five stars, if you could leave a nice little review just to show your appreciation for the show. Those types of things go a long way. Today, we're going to be talking a little bit about the standard contract form that is used on almost all residential uh, real estate purchases in the upstate of South Carolina what we call Form 310 or SCR 310. It's a form that was developed by the South Carolina Association of Realtors to standardize a purchase agreement that realtors could become familiar with and that then they could use to help write offers for their buyer clients and that listing agents would then receive and understand kind of the the main points of it uh, so that they can then educate their seller clients on what the offer says. Um, now, Greenville is unique in that this is essentially the only contract form that is used by realtors. Um, I know that there are other parts of the state of South Carolina that use other forms. Um, there are uh, contracts that builders will uh, will say that you have to use. So if you're building new construction, you likely will have to use a builder contract. So that is one exception. But otherwise, if you're purchasing real estate here in the state of South Carolina and in the area of general area of Greenville, Spartanburg, Anderson, etc., you will pretty much be making an offer on Form 310. Um, now, uh, my company actually, the company I'm with uh, currently, C. Dan Jordan Realtors, actually attempted to develop, with the help of, of attorneys and, and all sorts of different people, a contract that improved on Form 310 with the hopes of giving agents other options, other better options. Because at the end of the day, Form 310, it can be changed by the South Carolina Association of Realtors, uh, but we only have so much direct impact on how that can be done um, or on what changes will be made. And so my company, several years ago, attempted to draft a new contract form. But there was kind of a, a in my opinion, a, a mistake that was made, which was that they didn't involve other brokerages in that process. And so it became a political thing when that form then came out and when realtors attempted to use that form, some brokerages essentially, uh, they really skirted the line of what they could legally do or not do. But they, for all intents and purposes, said that they were not going to allow their seller clients to accept an offer on that form. And it was really, they they claimed it was because they wouldn't get support from the South Carolina Association of Realtors using that form. But really, it was just politics. And it's honestly quite frustrating because that was a superior form in for both parties, in my opinion, in comparison to, uh, to Form 310. That being said, um, there are some advantages, of course, to only having one contract uh, that essentially everyone uses. And that is, um, you know, the main obvious advantage is that all of us realtors in the marketplace, particularly those of us that have been doing this for a long time, we're so familiar with the form um, that we we know it, you know, like the back of our hand, so to speak. And the back of my hand right now is very dry. I struggle with dry hands this time of year, and I'm very aware of that. And I know Form 310 like the back of my uh, very dry hand at the moment. This happens, by the way, uh, every winter for me. And uh, yeah, it's, my skin is very white and very dry this time of year. Um, so obviously, when you start introducing other contracts into the marketplace, there are some inherent disadvantages from the standpoint of people maybe not knowing all of the language. So I understand that. Um, but at the same time, for three, Form 310 has some 
clear uh, disadvantages to it, primarily stemming from that there's a lot of things, a lot of language in there that is open to interpretation. I specifically talked about this in episode 26, which if you are a newer listener um, and you've not done a real estate transaction in the lovely state of South Carolina, I highly recommend you go back and listen to episode 26. Um, And if you are a longtime listener and you already listened to that episode, I'm not going to rehash everything that I said, so please bear with me, but I do need to review something very specifically in there. In Section 8 of Form 310, it talks about inspection rights and repair rights, Um, and there are three checkboxes of which one must be checked, and this was a change that was made last year from what Form 310 had for so many different years. Three checkboxes. One, as is. As is is the, the best checkbox if you are a seller to have checked. As is means that the buyer is, they're still allowed to inspect the property, but they're saying that they the contract is in no way contingent on their inspections. If they find out something really terrible in their inspections, they do not have a contractual right to back out. And at that point, it, typically, that would mean that their earnest money would be at risk of going to, uh, to the seller at that point. Um, there is a due diligence checkbox. Due diligence is the complete opposite end of the spectrum, which is a very buyer-friendly route to go. Due diligence typically used on investment properties or properties that um, have a lot of work that needs to be done on them um, or perhaps you know needs some things to be uh, looked into, like different uh, records, reports, leases, things like that. Um, Due diligence gives the buyer essentially an out to back out during the due diligence period for any reason that they want to. So obviously most sellers are not super happy when they get an offer that has due diligence on it, um, but there are some situations where that uh, is really the most logical option to check. And then there's a middle ground that we call repair procedure. Well, the contract calls it that, repair procedure, um, which essentially means that the buyer can inspect the property with a licensed inspector with a licensed inspector whoo man i'm recording this on monday and i can feel monday hitting me in squarely in the face here um they can have a licensed inspector inspect the property and then ask the seller to make repairs to the property but the seller is only obligated to make repairs that fit in nine categories again we discussed this in episode 26 go back and listen to that i'm not going to go through all of that. But the buyer only has a right to back out, essentially. And and the language is still even a bit ambiguous when it comes to this. But in essence, uh, the buyer can only back out if the seller um, does not agree to repairs in those nine categories, which are extremely limited categories. So what do we think about repair procedure? Well, at the end of the day, it probably causes more harm than good. And this is what this episode is about, is that the South Carolina Association of Realtors is talking about getting rid of the repair procedure from the contract and limiting us to only having the as-is and due diligence options. Or maybe they would come up with a different solution. But I assume they would probably default to probably tweaking the as-is or due diligence language and just eliminate repair procedure altogether. That's being discussed. Well, it was discussed some last year. It's going to be, it was tabled till this year. It's going to be discussed, I think, in a few weeks, is my understanding. Um, And so, yeah, there's a a good possibility that a year from now, um, or maybe even less than that, we'll be having another conversation discussing what Section 8 of the contract says. Um, But like I said, there are some major problems with repair procedure. Again, it's trying to strike the middle ground between being way seller-friendly and way buyer-friendly, but it leaves too much open to interpretation. Um, And in other concerns, other things that we run into, it really requires the buyers to make a very serious assessment of the condition of the house while walking through it. You have to, because of how limited the nine categories are, um, that the buyer, that the seller rather, is obligated to repair. There's really a lot of things that 
an inspector might flag, that would be a major problem to a buyer that a, an experienced buyer or an, or an inexperienced um, buyer's agent, I should say inexperienced buyer or buyer's agent, wouldn't notice just walking through. I've been with clients that don't pay very close attention to the AC unit, for instance, and maybe the seller's disclosure doesn't state the age of the AC, AC unit. Maybe the seller doesn't realize it. Well, let's say the AC unit is 20 years old. That's, for most units, five years or, or more older than a uh, an AC unit is expected to last. Well, repair procedure does not require the seller to replace it. It only requires for the AC unit to be functioning. Well, mind you that um, during the winter time when it's really cold, um, it might be hard to fully assess how the AC is even working. So if someone during their showing of the house, when they're looking at a house, doesn't pay very close attention to the AC unit, they may end up having an inspection that comes in that tells them, hey, the AC unit, we think it's probably working, we can't fully assess it, but it's really old. The buyer has no recourse in, in the standard language that's currently in there for uh, for repair procedure. Similarly, with a roof, it says in repair procedure that the seller has to make the roof free of leaks. But what if the roof is free of leaks but has substantial hail damage that the buyer did not notice, you know, when looking at the house? By the way, just as an aside, for those of you that don't know, I am, uh, I'm not really I'm not practicing right now. I shouldn't say I'm not really practicing. I'm definitely not practicing this right now because it's been, uh, you know, I've just been so busy with real estate for several years now that it's been years since I have done this. But I am actually a licensed uh, uh, insurance, a homeowner's insurance adjuster. Um, actually, technically, it would be personal lines, but you guys don't need to to know all of this. I'm a licensed insurance adjuster. I don't practice it anymore. I did. Uh, for a few years back in the day, but I try to help my clients see those types of things when we're walking through the house, and and I've done it multiple times. I can look at a roof and usually be able to identify whether it has hail damage or wind damage, et cetera, et cetera, um, even though I'm not a licensed inspector. You still need to have an inspector look at it, um, but I can identify some things very quickly from my experience as an insurance adjuster. But one thing I know, having been in that world for several years, is that if you purchase a home that has hail damage on it, you're, and, and then let's say that there's a windstorm that comes through and, and blows a bunch of shingles off the roof, or you know, let's just say that at some point um, you have more hail damage on top of the old hail damage, um, and you make a claim to your homeowner's insurance, your homeowner's insurance could come in there and say, you know what, there's old hail damage on here. We can't tell the difference between the new hail damage and the old hail damage. We're not going to replace this roof. And then you're stuck. And essentially, the roof is uninsurable. That happens way more often than you realize it. Um, but the repair procedure doesn't protect the buyer in the event that that hail damage is discovered on a roof. A roof could be uninsurable, in essence, to the buyer. But as long as the roof is free of leaks, the seller has done everything that they need to do. And even if the roof does have a leak, the seller doesn't need to replace it. They only need to repair the leak. Um, and, and they might do that untastefully. If you've ever seen new shingles on top of old shingles, it doesn't look very good. Um, so those are some of the flaws with the repair procedure that I can understand uh why they are considering removing it. And as you can probably assume, I think defaulting to the two options of as is or due diligence would in the end be a positive. Obviously, the one is seller friendly and the one is buyer friendly. But we as realtors, we've had to learn, particularly the past couple of years, how to find creative ways to strike a middle ground. One thing that we're seeing very commonly, even with repair procedure offers, is that Buyers are saying that they will not ask for a repair unless it exceeds a certain amount. In essence, they're saying we're not going to ask, you know, for ticky tack little things. We're only going to ask for repairs if they're big, if there's a structural problem, if there's a major, you know, uh, uh, the AC is or the heat is not working or something like that. 
So realtors will will still be able to find ways of still adding in language or modifying those as is or due diligence uh, clauses so that it's not so skewed in one direction or the other. Um, and and I've seen honestly I've seen offers made with due diligence currently checked where they even do that. You know, there's a, a line currently in the due diligence section that says that the uh, buyer can ask the seller for repairs. I've seen people strike that out and just say, no, we're doing due diligence, but we're not going to ask for repairs. We're just making sure that the property is, uh, that there's nothing major that needs to be done to this property. So we're already seeing some of that already happening. Um, but all that to be said, if we remove, if that repair procedure essentially becomes removed, um, we're going to see a big shift in Greenville. In fact, I bet that there will be some realtors that will revolt, that will con- continue to use the old contract because they don't like the new one. If that happens, that would not surprise me at all. And we're going to see uh, a rift f- for sure um, if this happens because it's a very controversial move. Um, but I think by and large, most of realtors would accept it and would just have to uh, re almost relearn their business, recalibrate how they approach uh, listings and buyer clients. And and I think in the end that buyers would be the biggest benefactors because ultimately uh, the majority of buyers, they're still going to want to be able to inspect a house to make sure there's nothing that they're, that they're missing. And so most of them are going to want there to be some sort of a due diligence period, which gives more, it, it's more lenient to buyers, it means that they're not limited to just those nine categories outlined in the repair procedure. And so maybe if they discover, hey, the roof has hail damage, this could be an uninsurable roof, then they can actually say to the seller, you need to replace the roof, or else I'm backing out and getting my earnest money back. Um, That, I think, is a potential positive development that could come out of this. And so um, as I said before, there would be if this happens, there's going to be a massive shift, a massive learning period, and the market, the entire real estate market, is going to have to account for this. Um, sellers who are used to repair procedure are obviously going to push for as-is offers. Um, obviously, buyers are going to uh, push for due diligence offers. They're not going to be comfortable uh, basically waiving their in- inspection rights. They're going to want to have some kind of uh, uh, ability to look at at the house, as I've already said. Um, now, there is one important little detail here, and that's in the due diligence section of Form 310, there is an optional termination fee. Um, and this is separate from the earnest, mo- earnest money. In essence, um, if a buyer backs out during the due diligence period, they have to forfeit that termination fee. Um, and then potentially, there, there could be a situation where the earnest money would also uh, come into play that they would they would need to forfeit their earnest money. That that it, it, again, it's a separate thing. So those two things would would be handled separately. Um, now, currently, when there's a due diligence offer, this field is really very rarely filled out. Most of the time, there is no termination fee with a due diligence offer. But my guess is if we removed repair procedure and went to as is and due diligence only, we would see this field needing to be filled out far more frequently because sellers would want the buyers to have some skin in the game, to not just be able to back out for any reason and get everything back. Um, and and it would probably reach a point where the uh, that termination fee would honestly become more important in many ways than the earnest money because the... You know, buyers have a gazillion way they a gazillion ways they can get their earnest money back, but the termination fee would really commit the buyer to the house unless um, un- unless they find something majorly important uh, that needs to be repaired on it, and the seller is not willing to do that. Um, and so, what will the standard termination fee end up being in this scenario? And I have no idea. The standard earnest money amount right now in in Greenville is one percent of the uh, contract price. Would the termination fee be that? Probably not. It'd probably be less than that, maybe half that. Uh, Maybe it would depend. Uh, You know, I think reasonably it would depend based on the condition of the property. Um, However, in the end, eliminating the repair procedure, it's far from a done deal. I've already said that realtors um, and the SCR are deeply divided over this issue. 
Um, some think that as is is too restrictive and due diligence is too broad. And they want to make sure they still have a middle ground in there. But I've heard from realtors in other states like North Carolina uh, that they only had those two options, is my understanding, as is in due diligence. And a lot of those realtors, they love it. They think it's a perfect system. So we'll see uh, as the SCR discusses this in a few weeks where they land. And I'll have more information to report to you guys once I get it. Uh, But that's it for today's episode. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please subscribe, leave a rating, five stars, of course. If you have it in you, leave me a review. Just take 10 seconds to leave a quick little review. All of my contact information is in the show notes. And hope you guys stay safe and have a great rest of the week.